on health care. Uh, the senator's had several plans so far. And uh, anytime someone tells you you're going to get something good in 10 years, you should wonder why it takes 10 years. If you notice, there's no talk about the fact that the plan in 10 years will cost $3 trillion. The reality is that our plan will bring health care to all Americans under a Medicare for All system. Under your plan, status quo, you do nothing to hold the insurance companies to, to task. I have the only plan that limits the ability of insurance companies to charge unreasonable prices, flat out. Harris herself became a bigger target, forced to defend her past record as California's Attorney General. She put over 1,500 people in jail for marijuana violations and then laughed about it when she was asked if she ever smoked marijuana. I did the work of significantly reforming the criminal justice system of a state of 40 million people, which became a national model for the work that needs to be done. And I am proud of that work. But it was Biden's long record that got the most attention, even when he tried to pivot. Why did you announce in the first day a zero tolerance policy of stop and frisk and hire Rudy Giuliani's guy in 2007 when I was trying to get rid of the crack cocaine. Um, Mr. Vice President, there's a saying in my community, you're dipping into the Kool-Aid and you don't even know the flavor. Uh, you, need to, you need to come to the city of Newark and see the reforms that we put in place. You are trying to shift the view from what you created. And Biden tried to turn the attacks back toward President Trump. Eight more years of Donald Trump will change America in a fundamental way. The America we know will no longer exist. A handful of Democratic candidates also went after Biden's former boss, President Obama. Here's what Biden said earlier today about those attacks. Well, I, I expected it. And uh, you know, look, I hope uh, we're going to get a chance to talk about the future of these other debates uh, that are coming up. I'm looking forward to them. and. Uh, I must tell you, I was a little surprised at how much of incoming was uh, about Barack. And he focused on immigration. And what he did was serious. He changed the dialogue. He changed the whole question. He changed what was going on. And the idea that somehow is com comparable to what this guy's doing is absolutely bizarre. Look, this is three years later. The world has changed. The president, ha President Trump has turned it upside down internationally. He has turned it upside down economically. People are hurting badly. There's no response. We faced a different problem 10 years ago when the economy collapsed because of Republican policy. So let's bring in Zach Friend and Molly Hooper. Zach is a Democratic strategist who worked on the Obama presidential campaign. And Molly is a CBSN political contributor. Thank you both for being here. Obama's former attorney general, Eric Holder, tweeted to my fellow Democrats, be wary of attacking Obama's record, built on it expand it, be there, but there is little to be gained for you or the party by attacking a very successful and still popular Democratic president. Zach, what's the danger in criticizing Obama? Well, Obama has an over 90, I think 95 percent approval rating still with Democrats. His legacy is something that's exceptionally popular. He built a coalition that all these Democrats that are running right now are trying to replicate. I'm not really sure what good it does uh, to go after the former president when the entire uh, caucus should be united against uh, the current president of the United States. And so I, I agree with Attorney General Holder. I agree also with Vice President Biden that it doesn't do any good to go after uh, the former president. We should really be focusing our energy and efforts on ensuring that this current president is a one-term president. Everyone we spoke to knew that Joe Biden was really going to be the center of attention during this debate. He got attacked on a wide range of issues from several of the candidates on stage. Molly, was he effective in defending his record and then explaining himself? You know, that, that's a tough one. As we just saw, he said... You only have one minute. Mm -hmm. You can't. This isn't really a debate per se. When there's nine other people up on the stage with you and you're fielding arrow, he didn't say the fielding it slings and arrows, but but that's what he was doing last night. You could. He was the only one pivoting from side to side, to side to side, within you know dealing with an incoming barrage of attacks. Um, but you know what? Whether or not he did a great job last night, it's definitely something to learn from because when President Trump, if you're the front runner and you become the Democratic candidate, you're going to have a lot of incoming attacks coming your way, and you'll need to be prepared for that. And I think that, um, you know, last night is something you'll probably want to go back and look at the tape and figure out where you can improve and, and move on from here. Zach, what did you make of how Biden defended Obama today? 
I thought it was the right thing to do. I mean, last night kind of reminded me of the Thanksgiving dinner where all of your family actually agrees on everything and then somebody brings up politics and all hell breaks loose. So I'm not really sure why it went off the rails the way it did because the differences between uh, these candidates is actually pretty minimal compared to the differences between these candidates and the current president of the United States. And I think that one of the things that the candidates are doing is that all their attention focusing on Biden is actually giving him a very clear lane in which to run. And they're not necessarily differentiating each other. When they totally turn their attention toward him, it makes him the clear front runner. In some respects, it actually advantages him. I felt that he did a good job defending the Obama legacy. I don't think it needs defending, though. I think that right now they should be looking forward on how they're going to change the things that are currently occurring, what they'll do for the next four years. And Biden referenced that when he was just speaking right now to reporters. Our polling shows that Biden does well with older black Democratic voters, but not as well with younger ones. Zach, is this generational divide something the other candidates are trying to exploit in their approach to Biden? Well, I do think that there are clear differences in the party right now, just like there were clear differences in the Republican Party in 2012 and 2016 of which way to go and which, in essence, which road to go. Half of all of our Democratic primary voters self-identify as conservative or moderate. Uh, it's clear that Biden does very well in general election polling, and I think that he's also doing well in primary polling because his positions are in line with the majority of the Democratic Party. However, uh, the current base of the party, similar to the 2016 base of the Republican Party has moved, and I think that some of his positions are not as in line with that, and that's what one of the some of these other candidates are trying to really uh, differentiate themselves and potentially exploit that difference. But I think that again, they're giving him that lane to run that nobody else really has. I want to reference some of the polls that we saw after the first debate. Senator Kamala Harris really saw a bump. And then she was pressed on her record as a prosecutor. She was attacked by rivals. Molly, do you think this is going to be a liability for her moving forward? It could very well be. And talking to Democratic lawmakers before she actually officially entered the race, this was something they were a little concerned about. And, and her record as the Attorney General of California is mixed depending on who you talk to. Calif to Californians, it's, it's extra tough. Um, but if you look outside the state and you really take a look at what she did and how she dealt with individuals, um, it might not be as tough as you think. And so, so Democrats, are, they are. The Democratic lawmakers I've spoken to were a little concerned about that. But keep in mind, last night, she wasn't just dealing with her record as a prosecutor. Um, she was also dealing with having to explain this, her Medicare for All plan, which all the candidates were kind of piling on last night. It wasn't just Obamacare that they were talking about. They were specifically aiming their arrows at her plan, Medicare for All, that seems to be all things to all people. And the reason they say seems to be is because, just like Biden, Biden said each candidate really only had a minute to talk about it. There, it wasn't, uh, you know, a true debate back and forth with one or two people. Um, and so I think the next, we'll see her try to explain that a little bit more. But again, this is, that's one situation where she's going to want to go and review the tape, perhaps. Right. <laughs> Just like a good sports player, Just right? Just like a good sports player. So let's look at both nights. I felt like there was this overarching theme that was this rift between moderates and progressives. Zach, you actually wrote an op-ed for the San Francisco Chronicle titled, Attention Candidates, the Path to the presidency veers through the center. Well, run us through your main argument here. Well, my main argument is that the president has no path if he doesn't win the Rust Belt states or industrial Midwestern states. I mean, there's just no path without Pennsylvania, Wisconsin, and Michigan. And we have to remember that if we win those states, and as the vice president just said in that uh, presser that he just did, in essence, this is a 70,000 vote differential. Or we're not even having this conversation right now. And it, the, it behooves the Democratic candidates to remember that uh, that uh, the African-American voters in Michigan and Pennsylvania and the white working class voters in the same states really will determine this election. And so these conversations that we're having, and I'm sitting here from California telling you this, some of the issues that we're talking about are really not issues that people across the country uh, have as their main focus. We should be talking about them uh, more or less about each other, less even about the President of the United States. And a large part of that op-ed is saying that we have to remember that the majority of these votes come through that area. We have to talk to people we don't always agree with. We have to be the party that's a big tent and inclusive party. That was the Obama coalition that won us two terms. That's what also, by the way, helped deliver us in 2018 the House of Representatives was through these swing districts. And I think that's where we should be focused our attention again in this presidential election. So what would you say to the people that are like, hey, it didn't work out for Hillary Clinton, Al Gore, John Kerry. They're all center-left candidates. They didn't get the bid. What would your reaction be to them? 
So I think that we can all ex post facto look at some of those races and say uh, what those candidates maybe could have done a little bit differently in 2016. There wasn't a lot of campaigning, by the way, in these states that we just uh, referenced. There's unquestionably some outside interference uh, that occurred in that component as well. And when, again, we're talking 70,000 votes out of tens of millions of votes cast. So it's not like this was a significant blowout for the current president of the United States, irrespective of how he likes to talk about his large win in 2016. I just think that we can't forget about these voters that have been base voters for Democrats for so many years uh, and can deliver us not just the House and the Senate, but also the presidency in 2020. Okay, let's look at current numbers. As of right now, only seven candidates, Biden, Sanders, Warren, Harris, Buttigieg, O'Rourke, and Booker have qualified for the next debate in September. Molly, will this be the field going forward, or do you think that any others may hang in there? I actually think following this debate, and this might be um, uh, perhaps not the most conventional of wisdom, mm -hmm. but one candidate who stood out to me, Steve Bullock. You know, former governor, well, governor of Montana of a red state. He won. I mean, it's something. I mean, he came into this race late. Um, he was. The, he's the former president of the National Governors Association. The last year, he spent working with governors across the, the country on a jobs program that he's really, you know, pushed. And and even though he, he his polling is not up there and his numbers still need some work, he may be one of those individuals that Democrats could possibly rally around. And I've heard that from a moderate Democrat or two, um, that, that they were surprised and, and pleased by his, by his performance. All right. I want to thank you both, Zach Friend and Molly Hooper. We appreciate you being here. Thank you. Thank you. Trade talks with China this week have not resulted in a deal. Instead, the president says he'll be ordering a new round of tariffs. CBS News White House correspondent Ben Tracy is at the White House now. Ben, there was supposed to have been a ceasefire in this trade war. So what happened? Well, that ceasefire appears to be over, and this is an abrupt escalation of this trade war between the United States and China. The president has announced a 10 percent tariff on $300 billion worth of Chinese goods. These are new tariffs, so these are goods that had not previously been tariffed. And the administration really has gone out of its way to try to only put tariffs on things that people aren't going to notice right away. But with this $300 billion worth of tariffs, people will notice this. This is the kind of stuff that you would probably buy at a store like Walmart or Target, Apple products, things like that that because they're simply running out of goods that are more parts and supplies, those sorts of things. So, so this, is, this is significant. It's also significant because these trade talks in Shanghai just ended a day, a day ago. The trade, uh, the trade team just came back here to the White House, so apparently that was not very fruitful. There are going to be more trade talks in September here in Washington. The president says these new tariffs will go into effect on September 1st, so clearly he's trying to use these as a bargaining tool to get China back to the deal that they thought they had at least a couple of months ago. The president has accused the Chinese of reneging on that deal and also not coming through on buying agricultural products and other things that the president had touted as concessions that his team had gotten. Ben, is the president prepared to stand his ground on this through 2020? He's facing re-election. It appears that way. I mean, if you believe his tweets, he's been tweeting this week, even as his trade advisors were just landing in Shanghai, he was basically throwing cold water on those trade talks, saying that he thinks China's dragging its feet and really trying to wait him out. His theory is that the Chinese might be waiting to see the outcome of the election, that if a Democrat gets elected, they think they might get a better deal. Well, the president has warned them. He has said, if I get reelected, you're going to get a worse deal than I have on the table right now, so you should probably make a deal. But the president does, at least rhetorically and with these tariffs, with this action, he does seem inclined to stand his ground and try to get them back to what he says was the deal that both sides had agreed to a couple of months ago. All right, Ben Tracy, thank you. Thanks. And the Senate has approved a sweeping two-year budget plan. Lawmakers voted 67 to 28 in favor of the deal, which was negotiated by House Speaker Nancy Pelosi and Treasury Secretary Steven Mnuchin. The plan would raise the debt ceiling and add $324 billion in spending. And it also adds $2 trillion to the nation's $22 trillion debt over the next decade. The budget deal is now headed to President Trump's desk, and he has indicated that he will sign it. An alleged American ISIS fighter is back on U.S. soil to face charges. The identity of the fighter is still unknown. U.S. officials transported the fighter from Syria. Reports say that the fighter is a U.S. Turkish national and was being held by the Syrian Democratic Forces, a U.S.-backed group. More than 2,000 foreign ISIS fighters from over 50 countries are being held by the SDF. 
One of Osama bin Laden's sons, Humza bin Laden, has been killed. He was in line to become the head of al-Qaeda, the terror group his father found it. The official tells CBS News Hamza was killed in a military operation but was not the target of the mission. CBS News national security correspondent David Martin has more. Officials say U.S. intelligence recently monitored conversations among members of al-Qaeda debating whether or not to keep Hamza's death a secret or acknowledge it and celebrate him as a martyr. Based on that intelligence, U.S. officials believe Hamza was killed in a strike even though he was not the target. With his father's name and charisma, Hamza represented the future of al-Qaeda. Even though Ayman al-Zawahri, bin Laden's longtime deputy, has led al-Qaeda since the 2011 raid which killed its leader. The United States has conducted an operation that killed Osama bin Laden, the leader of al-Qaeda. Letters captured in the 2011 raid indicated bin Laden was grooming Hamza to be the next leader. Zawahiri didn't measure up to bin Laden and they suffered from that. And the loss of Hamza I think is pretty substantial because there's not another Hamza behind him. Fran Townsend was President George W. Bush's counterterrorism advisor. You take out somebody like that at the top of an organization and an organization is going to flounder for leadership. As recently as last February, the U.S. believed Hamza was alive and offered a $1 million reward for information leading to his capture or death. Al-Qaeda tried to protect Hamza's identity by not releasing pictures of him as an adult. This video of his wedding was released by the CIA after it was captured in the raid which killed his father. President Trump brushed aside questions about Hamza's killing Wednesday. Uh, I don't want to comment on it. The Trump administration has imposed sanctions on Iran's top diplomat. Foreign Minister Mohammad Javad Zarif responded to the announcement shortly after. He said the U.S. is targeting him and thanked the country for considering him as a threat to America's agenda. The sanctions came down from the Treasury Department and could freeze any assets Javad has in the United States. Iran's president has also responded. Hassan Rouhani has called the sanctions childish. He also accused the U.S. of being afraid of his foreign minister. Ahead on CBSN, rapper ASAP Rocky testifies in his assault trial in Sweden. We've got a reporter in Stockholm with the latest. Plus, a pipeline explosion in Kentucky leaves one dead and several homes destroyed. More details after the break. You're streaming CBSN. I must tell you, I was a little surprised at how much incoming was uh, about Barack, uh, about the president. I mean, uh, I, uh, I, I'm not proud of having served him. I'm proud of the job he did. Uh, I don't think there's anything he has to apologize for. And uh, I think, uh, you know, it, it kind of surprised me uh, the degree of the criticism. But look, it's, uh, it's as I've told you before, and God love you, you've had to cover me a long time now, but uh, this is a marathon. And, uh, I feel good. I think we're, uh, you know, we passed the, the quarter mark and I'm feeling good. That was former Vice President Joe Biden earlier in Detroit reacting to the debate last night where several of his rivals attacked not just him, but also President Obama's policies. CBS News political correspondent Ed O'Keefe was there in Detroit where Biden spoke. He's joining us now. Nice to see you, Ed. So how did Biden think he did last night? Well, as, as he said, uh, he thinks the only thing he would have corrected is his closing statement when he bungled exactly what number supporters were supposed to text. Uh, reviews have suggested that this was a stronger defense of his past and his record than in that first debate, but perhaps not as smooth as it could have been. Uh, the defense he gave of himself out here in the streets of Detroit, however, this afternoon, pretty impassioned and a sign of what we might expect as the campaign rolls along. He reminded all of us that we're with him this morning. This is a marathon, not a sprint. And he still is convinced that he's doing just fine and, and could emerge in front. We're standing in front of what's called the Coney Island restaurant here, a hot dog restaurant in Detroit. He met with the mayor of the city, some leaders from the local NAACP chapter and Congresswoman Debbie Dingell. And uh, from here, we'll, uh, we'll head off uh, to other events across the country. Today, Biden, California Senator Kamala Harris, and New Jersey Senator Cory Booker, the three at the center of the stage last night, are all lingering here in Detroit to hold events, uh, meet with voters, and, and in some cases, perhaps play cleanup in trying to clarify and explain some of the things they were asked about last night. Ed O'Keefe, thank you so much. We'll be checking in with you. 
We're waiting a possible decision for Puerto Rico's legislature on Governor Ricardo Rosseo's Secretary of State nominee. Pedro Perluisi would move in to be next in line to become governor of Puerto Rico if confirmed. He lost to Rosseo in the 2016 primaries and previously served at Puerto Rico's congressional delegate. Rosseo is expected to resign on Friday. Lawmakers say that they will make a decision on whether to approve Perluisi either today or after Rosseo leaves office tomorrow. A Guatemalan woman whose daughter died after being released from an immigrant detention facility is now suing the private prison company that operates it. Yasmin Juarez says that her 21-month-old daughter, Maria, were detained for three weeks in a Dilly, Texas facility operated by Core Civic last year. The little girl died from a hemorrhage that caused brain damage six and a half weeks after their release. The lawsuit claims, quote, as a result of Core Civic's recklessness, negligence, and callous indifference to the health and safety of the families and small children detained at Dilly, Maria suffered an agonizing death, and Ms. Juarez suffered the unimaginable pain of watching her only child sicken, suffer, and die before her eyes. The suit demands $40 million from Core Civic. In a statement, a spokesperson for Core Civic said, we care about every person entrusted to us, especially vulnerable populations for which our partners rightfully have very high standards that we work hard to meet each day. The 21-year-old Juarez testified in front of the House Oversight Committee in July about her daughter's death and conditions at the Texas facility. Her lawyers have also filed wrongful death and negligence against ICE and other U.S. government agencies. A 65-year-old woman in Oklahoma was tased by police after refusing to sign a ticket. We want to warn you that this video may be hard to watch. Leave me alone! Put your hands behind your back! Leave me alone! Now! The woman identified as Deborah Hamill originally drove away when she was stopped over a broken taillight. She refused to sign the $80 ticket and kicked the officer while resisting arrest. That's when he used a stun gun on Hamill. The 58-minute long body cam video shows the entire interaction. Hamill has been charged with one felony assault on a police officer and one misdemeanor for resisting arrest. A new report says a shirt belonging to a missing Connecticut mom has now been found and that it was stained with blood. Jennifer Dulos was last seen on May 24th. The report says in addition to the shirt, a blood-stained bra and cleaning supplies were also discovered. Officials believe that the shirt is the same one Dulos was wearing the day that she disappeared. New Canaan police ref uh, refused to confirm that report so far. Police have charged Dulos' estranged husband and his girlfriend with evidence tampering in the case of the missing mother of five children. Rapper Ace Rocky told a Swedish court he tried to de-escalate the situation before he got into a brawl last month. Rocky, along with his cousin and friends, were detained after allegedly attacking a 19-year-old man in Stockholm. The artist says that he was acting in self-defense when two men began harassing him and his group. President Trump and several American celebrities are calling for his release. CBS News foreign correspondent Roxana Saberi has more from Stockholm. Rocky testified here today that he tried to de-escalate tensions when the plaintiff, Mustafa Jafari, tried to pick a fight with him and his friends. The rapper also told the judge that he repeatedly told Jafari to leave them alone, but that he appeared to be under the influence of drugs and wouldn't go. Rocky acknowledged that he later threw Jafari to the ground, but only after Jafari attacked his bodyguard. Jafari says at least one of the Americans hit him with a bottle. Legal experts say, if true, that would be crucial to the case and would carry an automatic prison sentence of at least one year. Rocky acknowledged today he picked up a bottle, but did not use it. We asked his attorney how fair he thinks the trial has been so far. How fair do you think the court proceedings have been? Fair. Yes. It's completely fair. How confident are you that your clients will be able to go home soon? Very. You think they'll be let go by next week? I hope by Friday. Tomorrow we expect to hear from witnesses here at court, including Rocky's bodyguard. The trial could wrap up tomorrow or could go into next week. Alex? Roxana Saberi, thank you. Edward Snowden has written a book, and the former National Security Agency contractor made the announcement on Twitter. He posted this video. Everything that we do now 
lasts forever. Not because we want to remember, but because we're no longer allowed to forget. Helping to create that system is my greatest regret. The memoir Permanent Record will be out in September. Snowden leaked classified information on NSA surveillance programs back in 2013. He faces charges in the U.S., including espionage. He is currently living in exile in Moscow, and there is no word on how much he is being paid for the book deal. The fathers of two American teenagers accused of killing an Italian police officer are in Rome this week. The teens are accused of stabbing the officer to death following an attempted drug deal gone wrong. They could both face life in prison if convicted. CBS News foreign correspondent Seth Doan is outside the prison in Rome. Swarmed by media, Finnegan Elder's father, Ethan, arrived at the prison this morning, saying nothing. Mr. Elder, can you tell us how you're feeling? His son has confessed, investigators say, to killing Carabinieri officer Mario Ciocello Rega, who was stabbed 11 times following a botched drug deal and extortion attempt, allegedly carried out by Elder and his former schoolmate Gabriel Natale Yorth. Police say Elder stabbed the officer with this 7-inch long military-grade knife, which he brought from the U.S. A photo apparently posted on social media and widely circulated shows Elder posing with a knife. Both teenagers had been drinking on the night of the killing, according to police, and at least one had also been doing drugs. The Carabinieri officer forgot his service weapon early Friday morning when he was called to investigate that alleged extortion attempt, in which police say the teens tried to get money and cocaine in exchange for a bag they'd stolen. Natale Yorth's father visited him in prison Wednesday, writing afterward, My meeting with Gabriel was emotional and hard for both of us, adding Gabriel never imagined there would be a confrontation and did not know his friend was armed. Outside the prison this morning, Natale Yorth's lawyer told us his client is very young and very emotionally stressed. Authorities say both teens are responsible for the killing. In Italy, someone can be charged for murder if they were involved, regardless of whether the person carried out the slaying. Natale Yorth's lawyer told CBS News that when he visited his client here in the prison earlier this week, the teenager cried the entire time. Seth Doan, CBS News, Rome. President Trump is offering a helping hand to Vladimir Putin to help Russia put out wildfires in Siberia. The fires are burning across a nearly 12,000 square mile stretch of Russian forest. That's 7 million acres. Fortunately, the fires are not near heavily populated areas, but smoke is spreading across the region. The White House confirmed that the call between the two leaders on Wednesday, Russian officials said that they are grateful for America's offer to help and said it would accept if need be. In Kentucky, at least one person is dead and five others are hospitalized after a massive pipeline explosion. It happened in Junction City, which is about 40 miles south of Lexington. Flame shot hundreds of feet into the sky. Hillary Lane has more on what caused that blast. It's getting bigger. The explosion lit up the sky after a gas pipeline ruptured early Thursday morning in Kentucky. The blast shook residents out of bed. Well, it woke us up and it was just a big roar and fire going all the way up in the sky as far as you could see. Five people were injured and several were missing as crews scrambled to the accident site in Lincoln County. It looked like an atomic bomb went off, basically. See the big cloud of smoke go up, you know, and I, I knew what it was. It was a gas line. Flames shot hundreds of feet into the air and could be seen throughout the county. Don, Emergency management worried about additional threats to the area. My concern is there are three pipelines in that area. One of them ruptured. Uh, you know, we've been assured that the other two are intact. At least six structures were damaged, some of them completely destroyed, as well as nearby railroad tracks. Dozens of residents were evacuated in the middle of the night. Part of the area that has been compromised, there's just nothing left. Engineers are inspecting the site, but say it could take several days to determine the cause of the rupture. Hillary Lane, CBS News, New York. 
Now to Texas, where a lawsuit has been filed against ExxonMobil after a refinery explosion yesterday. The Harris County Attorney's Office filed the suit today. At least 37 people were hurt. Exxon says all workers who received medical evaluation or first aid have been cleared to return to work. The Exxon facility processes materials used to make plastic industrial products. The fate of a pilot of a U.S. Navy jet that crashed yesterday is still unknown. The aircraft went down during a routine training exercise in California's Death Valley National Park near an area dubbed Star Wars Canyon. The F-A-18 Super Hornet jet, like the one seen in these pictures, exploded on impact. Seven people on the ground suffered minor injuries. The area is popular with aviation enthusiasts trying to watch fighter jets flying at low levels. The cause of the crash is under investigation.